a little over a month ago, a person from church who happened to be raised Catholic like myself, we were talking about the upcoming, at that time, Left Behind movie, uh, Rise of the Antichrist, which I went and saw, and felt convicted in talking with this person to do a sermon lesson on the topic, Is There a Rapture? So, I believe this will be an extremely comprehensive resource for many people to use to educate not only yourself, but to reach out and help others who may be uh, believing in this type of doctrine. Most importantly, everything has to be taken back to the words of Jesus Christ. And so I'm excited to cover this subject uh, for the benefit of many. Please look at the screen or turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 5. I'm going to read starting at verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. They have belied the Lord and said, It is not he, neither shall evil come upon us, neither shall we see sword nor famine. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? So I just want to comment and say that this fits perfectly with the attitude that I have seen in today's church, where we don't need to worry about any evil coming upon us. We're not going to be around to experience it. For some reason, we are entitled to an escape that our forefathers who suffered did not get that entitlement. And God tells us in our human nature that professing believers, his people love to have it this way when the false prophets come in and just make stuff up that can't be reconciled with the word of God. So the purpose of this particular sermon lesson is I'm going to talk about the word rapture. What is it? What does it mean? The origin and history. I'm also going to talk why is the Bible-related rapture doctrine taught. I'm going to cover what that is. I'm going to cover the subject of prove your statement of faith at church. No matter where you go to church, even if you don't, if somebody gives you a statement of faith or starts talking about what God says, prove it. Be like David. Prove it. And then trust in Jesus Christ for all teachings, precept upon precept, as he instructs us in Isaiah chapter 28. I'm also going to talk about what does Jesus Christ say about tribulation and a rapture? Does Jesus say in plain speech that he's going to rapture everyone? Left Behind Influence and recent Left Behind Film Notes. So I went to see the recently released, at the end of January, Left Behind movie, The Rise of the Antichrist. I normally wouldn't go see it, but I felt it would be important for me, if I'm going to give commentary on the subject matter, to at least see the movie and then take notes as I watch the film in the theater and comment on it. And then I'm going to say what really happened based on the authorized version of 1611 as God's word and witnessing to others. What will really happen based on what God's word says and how can we witness to others? And then I'll give a brief conclusion. So this is what I want to cover today, and I think that it'll help. First and foremost, if we go back in time to the secular dictionary, the word rapture has a definition that you see there's four distinct classifications of here on the screen. And the general sense of the word is some type of rapid movement uh, and you can read each individual classification. Uh, it could mean enthusiasm or an uncommon heat of imagination. So I don't see any Christian-based theology or doctrines listed here in the secular dictionary. This is from 1828. I have, over time, looked at many dictionaries that followed 1828, all the way through the current Webster's Dictionary, and I have seen this particular word subtly change its meaning in a variety of dictionaries over time. I'm going to get into discussing that more. 
first I'm going to cite a source. I'm going to read the rapture is an eschato <laughs> sorry, eschatological position held by some Christians, particularly those of American evangelism, uh, consisting of an end-time event when all Christian believers who are alive along with resurrected believers will rise in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The origin of the term extends from Paul the Apostle's first epistle to the Thessalonians in the Bible, in which he uses the Greek word harpazo, meaning to snatch away or to seize, and explains that believers in Jesus Christ would be snatched away from earth into the air. Um, so that's the source from Wikipedia. And uh, I just wanted to document what the current... Uh, at least definition or position is based on a what I will call a secular source. And before I go any further, I wanted to remind people of spiritual vocabulary. If you are a Christian and you have been born again, which is a requirement of being a Christian, you have spiritual discernment. Now, not everybody has the same spiritual gifts. So, you know, it, it, that's why we edify one another. So you have God discussing things spiritually to a group of few saved people, as opposed to many who profess to believe Christians get natural meanings only. They don't discern spiritual things because they can't, according to God. So air is symbolic of spiritual power. A bed is a place of slumber. It's equivalent to a Bible or an idol, like a corrupt Bible. Uh, a cloud would represent the prophets or Bibles. A lamp would represent a Bible or the Word of God, or perhaps a counterfeit, if it doesn't have oil in it, for example. A mark is a spiritual seal of acknowledgement. Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Sleep is slumber, which means people would lack discernment. And that holds true for both believers and unbelievers. You can also see Matthew chapter 25 on that. Women represent the churches. And to say in Jesus or in Christ implies that somebody is saved. So there's a bunch of cross-references to verses there. I just selected a few of them, two or three or maybe more for each one, just as examples. I didn't list every single cross-reference that I could have. Uh, but this is, if somebody's watching, you have to understand Christians discern spiritual things by the power of the Holy Ghost. And we have to know this in order to receive spiritual things and understand what the Lord is speaking to the saints as opposed to people that have not yet received the Holy Spirit. So this is important because if you don't have spiritual vocabulary, you can be carried away very easily by the doctrines of the world under the name of Jesus Christ, professing Christianity. My thoughts. Many Christians that I have talked to were not raised to believe in a rapture as it relates to a Christian doctrine. I'll just give one example. My wife was raised Baptist. She wasn't ever taught anything about a rapture uh, in, in her upbringing. Uh, some who profess a belief in a rapture have differing opinions about when it will occur. I've talked to pastors and professing believers about this. Some, a lot of people say the rapture is going to happen before tribulation. Some think it's going to happen mid-tribulation, and some believe it will happen post-tribulation. I personally recognize the word rapture as coming from the Roman Catholic Bible of 1610, which I own a copy of. However, the word rapture was not used in my Catholic education. When I used to be a Catholic, I really never understood the word rapture and what it meant to begin with. It was never used commonly. And I really don't understand it even today to, to be a word that fits in with any type of biblical doctrine because it does not appear in the canon of Scripture. I draw the line at not introducing words outside of the canon of Scripture to define things, because that could become a snare. That's my personal conviction. Common references are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You guys can pause and read that on the screen, 
But if you have spiritual vocabulary, some of the things that I'm going to point out are there's a reference to people being asleep, and there's a reference to people being dead in Christ, and clouds, being caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, you can read that as a natural person, and you can read that as a spiritual person. I'm not here to force my discernment on anyone, but I'm here to say that I have a spiritual vocabulary, and I know it's taught to me from the Holy Spirit, and I can show precept upon precept in a multitude of counselors in Scripture, because God's testimonies are my counselors, not the precepts of men. Other common references to the doctrine that I've heard, you know, as far as a rapture, people getting physically removed from the earth, are in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, sleep is a word that's used. Uh, and being raised incorruptible and putting on incorruption. In Matthew chapter 24, it says, and knew not until the flood came. Well, is there a spiritual flood coming out of the mouth of the serpent, as it says in the book of Revelation, as opposed to a literal flood? And is that spiritual flood a bunch of false, corrupt Bibles? Okay, and two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment, especially on the two women further. I'm going to go deep into this particular doctrine to show you guys how I base my discernment through my own personal Bible study, just to explain why I believe what I believe. And I think it's up to everyone as an individual believer to pray and study and ask the Lord for discernment and conviction, because we all have to be accountable for our words and our beliefs. Where did the word rapture come from as it relates to Christian doctrine? And I'm going to put in parentheses because no one seems to know. And I mean that sincerely. This word gets introduced in the context of some type of Christian doctrine. And it's just like that when I was in uh, elementary school, we played a game called telephone. And I remember in second grade, uh, about 25 of us in class all lined up around the room in a circle, and we started at one end. And the teacher whispered something clearly into the first child's ear. I can't remember exactly what it was, but, you know, it may have been something as simple as, you know, the boy walked down the street looking for his dog and found him one hour later. Maybe a simple sentence like that. And then... The, the, the next person whispers, so that no one else can hear, whispers into the ear of the person next to them. And that cycle keeps repeating itself until all 25 people have gone through the process. And the 25th person has to recite what the teacher originally told the first person. And the lesson here to young children in elementary school is that communication can get botched if you don't trace it to the original source exactly. So by the time the 25th child recited what the teacher had originally said, it had nothing to do with, you know, the original sentence that was stated. It was completely different, and we all laughed. But what was taken away from that lesson, and I'll never forget, is how communication can get botched by people very easily. And that not only goes for verbal communications, but written communications as well, which is why it's so important to not accept unfamiliar words in our vocabulary as Christians. We have to prove everything. So the word rapture comes from the Jesuit Dewey Reams Bible of 1610. And I show on the screen here that uh, the definition here says also to be taken up to heaven or to be carried away in spirit. So maybe a physical taking away into heaven or carried away in spirit, which I guess as an entry-level word definition doesn't sound so offensive because God does talk about the angels gathering the elect in his word. But 
This is the origin of the word rapture, and the word does not appear in the canon of Scripture as it relates to the Christian Bible. This is an expansion showing exactly how it's uh, discussed in the Jesuit Dewey Reams Bible. Uh, you guys can read what it says on the screen. My comment is that this does not appear as a word in the current Dewey Reams Bible. So why was it removed? If the Pope is infallible when it comes to speaking about Christian doctrine, why was it retracted? I'm just asking a question. So, I guess my thought would be, the word rapture is not currently used by the Catholic Church, to my knowledge. It seems to be used by a group of professing Christians who really believe they are on the right track. Most of what I heard comes from the Independent Baptist, but I've also heard a rapture doctrine, mostly pre-tribulational, uh, out of a variety of different types of denominations. So why is that? How does a word jump from a Jesuit Bible to a Christian church? And does this word mean what the Lord says? So going back to the Webster's Dictionary of 1828, I'm going to show on the screen water moving as a symbol of what I would get out of the word rapture, kind of like a rapid movement. If you're watching a river rushing, uh, hitting water hitting rocks, and the water moving rapidly, that would be a classification where you would use the word rapture to describe what you're seeing. But you can see again how the word is defined in the secular dictionary. Keep in mind that the Webster's 1828 Dictionary also commonly used references to the authorized version or the, the KJV uh, throughout the dictionary to define words as well. So uh, we seem to have lost that because much of that has disappeared today. So why is the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine taught? I'm going to ask some questions that I think everyone should consider. And I'm going to ask, it's taught because, is it because the Bible's been corrupted, as God says? Do any of these teachers use what they believe are incorruptible Bibles? And what versions are they? Uh, is it the, because the Bible is too confusing to some, that they, they don't understand the books of prophecy? The entire Bible, God's Word, is a book of prophecy. So if they understand spiritual things, why are they believing in something called a pre-tribulation rapture? What about uh, losing faith in Jesus Christ? What if this event doesn't play out uh, where all these clothes and socks and shoes are empty laying around like the movies, the Left Behind series shows? If that doesn't happen, will it cause people to lose faith in Jesus Christ? What about the many hardships that will happen if there is no so-called pre-tribulation rapture escape? Is that one of the reasons this doctrine is taught? What about the pardon at the guillotine mentality? So what I mean by this is, well, you know, if bad things happen and I'm left behind, well, I'll just make sure that I die for Jesus. Well, you have to be sealed by the Holy Spirit in order to be saved and ultimately brought into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you need to be born again of incorruptible seed. So is this doctrine caught, uh, taught because it will give people a sense of comfort that they can just uh, die at the guillotine then if they're left behind? What about a fake rapture? What if there were infrastructure, or what if there was infrastructure in place to quickly slaughter a lot of people, and this infrastructure was transparent or hidden from us? And could a fake rapture occur? 
where people aren't being caught up in the clouds, as Jesus Christ teaches, but rather being brought down and slaughtered. Is that why this doctrine is taught? Something to consider. What about a failure to understand God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit, which if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're alive at the time of the abomination of desolation and the oath that the book of Zechariah describes uh, where people will swear uh, to this abomination, I think Zechariah chapter 5 and a multitude of other places in scripture, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're going to be caused to receive the mark of the beast. So is that another reason why the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine is taught? Is it taught to people that really don't have any discernment about what God says because they're using a broken testimony and the scripture cannot be broken? Because Jesus didn't have any broken bones when they took him down off the cross. So if you have a broken Bible, and I've got a separate a uh, pretty lengthy sermon video on the channel regarding this, then what is your discernment going to be? Do you have a spirit of slumber? Do you have oil in your lamp? Things that everybody that professes to be a true believer should be considering and, and really proving and taking inventory of their own faith. The New Hampshire Confession of Faith, I'm going to bring this up because if you go back to church history, there's something very important. There were confessions made of faith to lock down Christian beliefs so that there can't be deviations from the truth, so that people creeping in unawares cannot beguile the so-called believers. I believe that's the main purpose of getting the Confessions of Faith documented. So you can read on the screen that there was a confession drawn up by a guy named John Newton, uh, John Newton Brown, and it was in New Hampshire around 1833, sometime around the Oxford movement, and you can read what else it says on the screen, but it did not have anything about a rapture reference in it because I've read the original. The pre-trib rapture doctrine was added to something that looks very similar to the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, but sometime in the 20th century, after Rome seemed to infiltrate churches on a scale of great magnitude, and I say that only because of the devastating effects of modern Bibles, whose text seemed to align perfectly with the teachings of Rome and their text in many places, such as the location of the mark of the beast, for example, or how to try the spirits, as it says in 1 John chapter 4. So the, what I'm going to get to is when you decide to attend a church, at some point, you may be asked to join the church, to become a church member. So I started attending and bringing my family to a church, Bible Baptist Church of Carpentersville, in, actually in 2008 sometime. And at that point, uh, this goes back to 2009 now, the constitution of the church mentioned something about a rapture. And you can read what it says on the screen. So I'm going to show you how my wife and I went through before we decided whether or not to become members of this church, and we read through the Statement of Faith and all the articles of the church, marked them up, and gave them to the pastor, backed by scriptural support. And as a result, the pastor of the church removed the pre-trib rapture doctrine in early 2012, from the church's statement of faith. I do not know during the time I was t attending the church any visitor or new person that came to the church who came in believing in a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. The only time I heard that profession of faith was from visiting missionaries that would preach on occasion coming into the church looking for financial support typically. 
but most cases here, they are just talking about their belief in a pre-tribunal tribulational rapture as a result of their education from some university where they studied theology. That's my general experience with these missionaries and talking with them. And we had some missionaries that just left our church uh, very quickly when we didn't agree with what they were saying. There were some hostile moments there. So here's a letter that my wife and I put together back in 2010 uh, when we considered becoming members to the church. I believe the church may have offered us an opportunity uh, to become members. And so we told the pastor that we had reviewed uh, the Articles of Incorporation, the Church Covenant, the Statement of Faith, and the Bylaws carefully. And we had the following comments. And first of all, as far as the Statement of Faith, it, I read the Statement of Faith along with my wife, and it appeared to be a revision of the Baptist Confession. The Confession was drawn up by John Newton Brown, as I mentioned earlier. And um, you can read what I say there. But I expressed a concern that uh, maybe there were some revisions made to it. Uh, so we suggested the insertion of the authorized version of 1611. And then we were not shy in citing our disagreements. And we professed a belief that the Word of God can only be defined as the Bible that was put into the hand of King James in the year 1611 as the Word of God in English. And it includes the books of the Apocrypha, which are not inspired, but they must be placed in between the two Testaments. We said that subsequent revisions of this Bible must carry the associated title and not the 1611. For example, the 1769 Oxford Revision, which is widely accepted as the 1611 Bible, uh, had been changed in a number of places. So we've got false advertising. Don't call it the authorized version if it's different than the authorized version. That was our first point of contention. Secondly, we said that God's Word, the AV 1611, can only be read and prophecy fully understood as follows. A, the reader is a born-again believer. That's important because many people think they're Christians, but they're not. They haven't received the Holy Spirit. So I don't want to be on their playing field of understanding. B, Scripture must interpret itself and not be privately interpreted. As God warns us all throughout his word. The Holy Spirit will lead you around precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, all around Scripture so that we use God's testimonies as our delights and our counselors because in a multitude of counselors there is safety, safety in interpreting scripture and not coming up with a private cult-like interpretation. And then we went on to make many, many, many more points. I'm not going to show the entire letter, but I will cut to the end here and show towards the very end of the letter, this is our markup where uh, in one of the church documents, it talked about we, Bible Baptist Church, uh, hold the teaching that Jesus Christ will call his people out to be with him called the rapture. Okay, and I just disagreed with it because I couldn't reconcile that word and that understanding before tribulation with the word of God. Now, neither could my wife. So we as a couple uh, refused to subscribe to that doctrine. Now, I don't care if everyone in the world disagrees with me. That's fine. I'm not the type of person that's bothered by that. My whole point here is every single person who thinks they're a Christian and is attending a church should, by their duty as a Christian, understand what their church's statement of faith and articles of belief are and make sure you're in full agreement with them. And if there's things you take exception to, communicate that to the pastor and the church leaders so that there's no misunderstanding. The problem is the vast majority of people that profess to be Christians, many of them don't have the Holy Spirit, number one. And those that do, many times don't push back because they don't either want to offend or maybe they don't have a mastery of the subject matter or maybe they just don't have an unbroken testimony of the Word of God to start with. 
So what I'm saying is, whether you believe what I believe or not, I'm not going to be too concerned with. But what I am concerned with is we as Christians have to understand by the power of the Holy Spirit that there is an unbroken testimony that God will show the individual and it's reconciled precept upon precept. I believe that. I understand that. And of course, I want people to understand that as well. My whole point is I can't force anyone to believe what I believe. That comes from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a belief in his word. And that word cannot be broken. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. In Matthew chapter 24 it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So, if you know what the abomination of desolation is, and God has taught you in a multitude of places about this, that's fine. You have an understanding of what it is, and when you see that, if you're going to be around and you see it placed where it ought not to be, in accordance with the prophet Daniel, then God gives you instructions of what you should do. And those instructions are spiritual. They're going to be foolish to a natural person who only understands natural things. But these are commands from God for people that will be around during the end times, right when the abomination of desolation is placed once and for all. Jesus Christ taking his people out of the world because it's popular under, popularly understood today that you know, according to movies like I saw, the Left Behind movies, that, it, 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 you know, you just pray this prayer, welcome to the family. There's no near-death chastening or scourging going on. It's just, Jesus, we love you, we believe you. We're going to take any Bible or, or anything at all and just, Jesus, we believe you. And we're not going to be here, so we don't need to worry about really studying the correct word of God or that many corrupt it. We're just going to get zapped out of the world and our clothes are going to be left behind. Is that what Jesus says? Does Jesus keep them from tribulation? As the movies show, as the Left Behind series shows, as many churches' statements of faith seem to imply. It says in John chapter 17, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. If you're a spiritual creature in Christ, God can protect your flesh and keep you from the evil, but still have your fleshly body live in this world. He can do that. I know that there's somebody that's going to watch this sermon video that told me an amazing account of somebody that he knows that was protected by a formidable appearing angel when a group of other people were trying to ultimately uh, sacrifice this guy. This guy got involved. There was a man that got involved with uh, some type of witchcraft, and they were going to kidnap him and sacrifice him somewhere out in the Northeast. And uh, an angel of the Lord was sent to take this guy out of that uh, situation. Uh, but in, the whole point I'm getting to is that God can use his messengers to protect his people without zapping them out of the world physically. What else does Jesus Christ say about tribulation? Deuteronomy chapter 4, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou shalt turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient unto his voice. My sheep hear my voice, of course, Jesus says in John chapter 10. Judges chapter 10. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. 
Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. You don't want to believe on Jesus Christ? Then your idols are not going to save you, is what God is telling his people here in the book of Judges. Matthew chapter 13. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. If you're not sealed with the Holy Spirit, you cannot continue in the faith. When persecution or tribulation comes, you're going to fall away. I mean, I, I, I can think of a specific example of Peter wasn't permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit until Pentecost, and he cursed, swore, and made an oath that he did not know Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? As an example to all of us that are in the flesh and not sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we ourselves will fail 100% of the time without Jesus Christ. You must be born again. You must be sealed by the Holy Spirit. Or you're going to wind up uh, caving in when fear comes and persecution and tribulation comes. So Peter did three things. He cursed, he swore, and made an oath that we are warned there are dire consequences in doing those. And those dire consequences are a result of not being born again of the Spirit because that's what's going to happen. By our words we shall be justified and by our words we shall be condemned. And you can't confess Jesus Christ except you do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it says in God's Word. In Matthew chapter 24 it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. So if we're being warned about by the Lord Jesus Christ of great tribulation, why would we not take heed to this? Do we think we can just dismiss this because we're not going to be around? In Acts chapter 14, it says, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through uh, much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. My comment will be, it says, actually, odd that we must through. And I believe odd is a variation of the word and, which is why I'm going to pronounce it both ways. It's not a typo. they are two words that, to me, are synonymous, and they both appear in a multitude of places in Scripture. So I just wanted to comment there. Because a lot of times we're taught that these are grievous spelling errors and all this stuff, and that's not the case here. Romans chapter 2, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that, doth, or that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Okay, Who does evil? People that are not born again of the Spirit. But even God's people will suffer tribulation as well. But there's going to be suffering among everyone, ultimately. Romans chapter 5, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. In Romans chapter 8 it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Well, I'm going to comment here that there's more going on than just literal meanings here. Famine, not of bread, but of hearing of the word of God, which is happening right now. Nakedness, not necessarily a lack of physical clothing, but a lack of being saved. Sword, when sword comes, sword is symbolic of the word of God or a counterfeit, which can slay both... <laughs> Not only can you be slain by a physical sword, but you can be slain by a spiritual sword with your tongue cursing your soul because you're confessing a false Christ. Romans chapter 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, who comforteth us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. If you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, you should have peace. And you don't really, you know that God will bring you through any trials or tribulations in your life. And those work patience. 
and they can have positive outcomes in the long run. You know, maybe you learn more through going by going through certain experiences or tribulations. Uh, you come out a little stronger, for example. Okay, but this is a reality. If you're going to be a Christian, the world's not going to love you. It's going to hate you because it hates Jesus. So in John chapter 16, it says, These things I have spoken unto, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In our spiritual bodies, we've overcome the world by the power of Jesus Christ if we've been born again. In the world, we're going to have tribulation. We're going to be persecuted. And our flesh, fleshly bodies still have to be here when that happens. Uh, but be of good cheer because you're born again. You'll have eternal life. And if God doesn't want you physically harmed while you're here, then you're not going to be physically harmed. If he wants you to be persecuted in a certain way, that's going to happen. But God's in control. And we have to keep the faith uh, so that we understand that, you know, the, the wicked one or the evil one doesn't touch us, save unless God allows this to happen for whatever purpose he has. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. If you look at the early church, there were great persecutions and tribulations. If you believe in Jesus Christ and you profess a true belief in him, if you're confessing a real Jesus Christ, the world's going to hate you. Look at what happened to the apostles, the disciples, uh, and other accounts in Scripture of what people suffered because of their faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. In Revelation chapter 1, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, John was the apostle that Jesus loved. Jesus loved all of his apostles, but he specifically uh, gave John a special, uh, how do I say it? There was a special acknowledgment that John was the disciple or apostle that Jesus loved. Now, if John suffered tribulation, why would all of the people using broken scriptures believe they're going to be zapped out of here before any evil comes upon them? Well, the answer lies in a passage of scripture that I quoted earlier, because people love to have false prophets tickle their ears, so to speak. God's people love it that way because it's easier to comfort ourselves in our own natural understanding with that as opposed to accepting the realities of a spiritual testimony where we are led by the Spirit to understand that we're going to suffer persecution and tribulation if we live in Christ Jesus, but to a certain extent that God allows, okay? He, he's going to protect people based on his purpose. Revelation chapter 2, it says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So I'm going to just comment spiritually there. To say you're a Jew doesn't mean a literal Jew. It means a spiritual Jew if you're a spiritual creature in Christ. What is a spiritual Jew? If somebody comes and says, oh, brother or sister in Christ, if they claim to be a Christian, but they're really part of the synagogue of Satan, we'll just call that the Babylonian church system, and worse yet, her two treacherous whoring daughters, uh, Jerusalem and Samaria, okay, as it says in the book of Ezekiel. So Jesus is counseling one of the churches here, and he's recognizing that they have tribulation. In Matthew chapter 24, it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for not my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And, and I'm just going to remind everyone that Jesus says, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, so to endure till the end means you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And there's spiritual meanings to a lot of the terms here. Uh, spiritual famine, spiritual pestilence, spiritual earthquakes as well. Those have meanings beyond just the normal, literal, natural understandings of the word. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand." Stand has a spiritual meaning to it as well. And the abomination of desolation is taught by Jesus Christ to his saints over and over and over. You should recognize what it is by God's power and not listen to the precepts of men. So when you see it, if, if we are around when it's placed, then we have instructions on what to do. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Meaning, again, you can only endure to the end if you have the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. You have to have the Holy Spirit to endure this type of persecution. 1 Peter chapter 3. But and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. It says in Matthew chapter 24, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now the four winds is a theme that is taught in a multitude of places in Scripture. And winds represent doctrine as well, and clouds we know represent prophets. But the key here is this is after the tribulation. It's not before. So the gathering of the elect does happen after the tribulation, according to the book of Matthew. So the rapture, let's take a look at the earliest known reference to the word rapture, which indicates that it is to be taken up into heaven. The saints will be caught up, but when and how? We find that the English word rapture from Jerome's Latin is in the Jesuit Dewey Reims Bible of 1610. Strangely, this word and teaching was removed from the Dewey Reims sometime after 1610, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, Prior to the start of the Oxford movement, which I mentioned earlier, sometime it started in the 1820s, Jesuit priests Lacunza and Ribera had been providing documentation which seems to have influenced a secret rapture doc doctrine. There are a great number of sources on this. One of them I've listed below. You can read about that. Okay. There's no question or debate whether or not a secret rapture doctrine came from the Roman text. The word rapture comes from the Roman text. Uh, so I'm going to get into that a little bit more. But before I do, Here's some discernment that I have heard from pre-tribulation rapture subscribers. So what I want to do is, again, as I mentioned before, I really don't care if people 
believe what I say or not. I just want them to believe the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here just showing what I've been taught by God's power, showing precept upon precept. Uh, I'm not here to make entertaining films uh, that I charge money for and uh, profit from, ultimately, uh, as Hollywood does. Um, I have not profited from any Christian entertainment or any Christian merchandise ever. Uh, so the pre-trib believers, uh, the Bibles that they use, there's I've I've seen all different types of Bibles connected with a pre-tribulation pre-tribulational rapture doctrine, including the KJV of 1769, which is not at all the authorized version of 1611, uh, the NIV which is heavily aligned with the text of Rome and I believe is also heavily influenced from the Vatican and Synodic manuscripts, as is the New American Standard Bible, which is a revision of, of the American Standard Bible, which was heavily influenced from the English Revised Version of Westcott and Hort. The Amplified Bible, which is from the same text again, the critical text, and has apologetics into it where they at least are trying to tell you how to interpret their text, which is completely different than the Word of God and happens in many places to align with the Roman Catholic teachings or text. The English Standard Version, the New King James Version, the New Living Translation, all these have many word changes that line up with Catholic Bibles. Okay, Whether they're called Catholic Bibles or not, I recognize them as lining up very heavily with the Roman Catholic text and teachings in some cases. So cutting to the chase here, you, you get random Bible subjects like Leviathan. People that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture typically say, well, Leviathan must be a crocodile for whatever reason, whether they read, read it in the margin notes or that's the, just their discernment. But what God's teaching the saints spiritually is all about Antichrist, the Pope. As I've mentioned countless times, all the references in God's word to Leviathan are just simply reminding the saints of how the Pope or Antichrist is using the wisdom of Lucifer to manipulate the people on earth into false doctrines which ultimately lead to an eternal condemnation, damnation. Uh, behemoth, people think is a hippopotamus, but God teaches us that Behemoth is the king of Babylon, Satan. Uh, Mark of the Beast, something taken, something probably most people that believe in a pre-trib rapture don't put a whole lot of thought into because they're not going to be here. Well, why do they need to worry about it? They're not going to take the mark. Well, Jesus Christ never discusses taking any mark or any mark being forced on anyone. That's not at all what happens. This is a spiritual mark that is given because of a swearing of an oath a cursing of one's soul, and uh, a denial of Jesus Christ by professing in a, a belief in a false Christ. Okay, and that's taught all throughout the Word of God. So all these natural understandings are, are foolish to God. Amplified Bible uh, uh, goes into, I just want to comment, and I'll show an example coming up here. They actually use the word rapture in parentheses, and I'm going to get to that. Uh, but you take the subject of the Song of Solomon, I've heard most of these people say, oh, it's just beautiful love poetry. Well, the Song of Solomon in the authorized version of 1611 is a powerful book of prophecy uh, describing how the Antichrist deceives the world who's drunk on his doctrine. That ultimately comes from Satan. This is all taught in the song, goes straight over the heads of natural people and people that have a spirit of slumber. Uh, Antichrist, you know, like in the Left Behind movie, they focus on one final bad guy, okay, one final Antichrist. We won't be here, but, you know, maybe he was Nero, as the Catholic Church teaches in their notes. Maybe it was just Nero, and we don't have to worry about him anymore. We're not sure. We're not going to be around. But in God's word, Antichrist is always present in the world. There's always Antichrist, okay? you got the visible head of the Babylonian religious system that reigns over the kings of the earth, understood to be the Pope of Rome by Christians throughout the ages. Okay, uh, salvation. A lot of the pre-trib rapture subscribers that I've heard, 
think about doing good deeds and being judged by their flesh. I've heard this straight from their mouths. I've taken notes. You know, we're, we're not like all those other sinners. We don't go to the bars and drink beer or alcohol. We don't dance. We don't. Our women don't wear makeup. We love to eat. Well, God says that salvation is a function of being born of the Spirit and that your flesh is not justified. Yet no, no flesh is justified by the law. So the just shall live by faith. Walk in the Spirit so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Have a spiritual body because Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. You're not going to delight in your flesh if you're a true Christian, but you're not going to be able to keep the law in your fleshly body because it's been fulfilled through being born of the Spirit. So that's the difference. And then you've got wine. I've heard countless pastors and people say, well, you know, we're, uh, the, we're, the scholars are leading us to understand that wine was really grape juice because Jesus would never use the word wine where it would have any alcohol in it and all this stuff. Well, wine makes the whole world drunk in God's word. I mean, when God talks about wine, spiritually, the whole world is drunk on it. How can you be drunk if it doesn't have alcohol in it? Just take, for example, a natural wine has alcohol. You can consume a little for your stomach's sake, for your infirmities. There's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't, if it goes into your mouth, it's not going to defile you. It's what comes out, the spiritual wine, the drunkenness of confessing a false or perverted Christ. That's what's offensive to God. So I just wanted to say, as someone who's um, discussed the subject matter with a lot of people that believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, this is a typical set of professing beliefs. I can't say that every single person I've ever talked to believes everything on this screen, but I'm making a general statement. This is what I've heard when I have uh, assessed what comes out of their mouths. Jesus says, by their, by their fruits ye shall know them. Are they in a spirit of slumber? What are they telling you is God's word? If they're saying the NIV is God's word, then I really question, have they received the Holy Spirit? Okay, I'm going to get into this rapture subject a little bit further, a little bit deeper, because it comes from the Jesuit Reims Bible that was based, that's an English Bible based on the Jerome's Latin Vulgate. Now, Jerome, around A.D. 383, wrote a letter to the Pope. The Pope had asked him to uh, essentially revise the Latin Vulgate, uh, but maybe they presented uh, Jerome with some type of uh, they just, just make some refinements to it, just make an update to it. But really the agenda was to revise it and pervert it. And so what does Jerome say here? He's addressing Pope Damascus. He says, you urge me to revise the old Latin version and as it were to sit in judgment on the copies of the scriptures, which are now scattered throughout the whole world. And inasmuch as they differ one from one another, you would have me decide which of them agree with the Greek original. And he's lamenting, you can read what it says at the top there, about having to do this task. And I don't believe Jerome felt that this uh, Latin that he had revised was faithful to the original autographs. So if it starts out with uh, a problem with corruption and a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, and the scripture cannot be broken, what do we have here with Jerome's Latin? And can you, if you take a corrupt Latin text, how can you make a pure English translation from it? But dollars cannot measure what Dewey Lockman meant. He was a well-known local leader and a philanthropist. He was active in the Gideon Society for 31 years and a member of the Masonic Order. So Freemason Franklin Lockman published the Vaticanus Sinaiticus Influenced New American Standard and Amplified Bibles. You can go to the website there, the Lockman.org uh, website, and read further if you want. What is my point here? 
We've got a former 90th degree Freemason and also a former Catholic priest. He did. He was both concurrently. Bill Sneblin said he thought the Jesuit order was founded, founded masonry, made it up, made Freemasonry in order to create an illusion that somehow this group opposes Rome, but they're really working for the same cause. This was from a testimony that I heard Bill give. And I've mentioned many times I don't necessarily agree with all of Bill's doctrines, uh, but I do believe he is given accurate and sincere, sincere accounts about his own experiences and beliefs as a former Catholic priest and a former 90th degree Freemason. Most people think Freemasonry goes up to 33 degrees. I personally believe it goes much higher than 90 degrees. Uh, and I have spoken with many former Freemasons and some existing Masons uh, and collected my own information and made my own opinions about the subject matter. Okay, all I'm saying here is that if for some reason Freemasonry was in fact created by the Church of Rome, what type of agenda do they have? Well, you can judge that agenda. Let's look at the Amplified Bible that Dewey Lockman ultimately was behind. What does it say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Then we who are alive and remain on the earth will simultaneously be caught up, raptured together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort and encourage one another with these words concerning our reunion with believers who have died. There's my source. So what's the problem here? Where, where did the word rapture come from? The only original source is from the Jesuit Reims Bible. So why is a Freemason using a Vatican synodic influence text to introduce new words to explain a doctrine that the Lord never talks about in his word? Something to think about. But this is one rare case where you can actually find in parentheses the word rapture or raptured, uh, explaining the concept that we're just going to be zapped out of here. You know, is this how the Church of Rome operates? Do they strategize over centuries to get their doctrine into the so-called Christian believers? Something to think about and pray about. Job 41, Leviathan, uh, the authorized version of 1611 lesson about how Antichrist deceive the world with power from Satan. That's what Job 41 is all about. Every line, Holy Spirit's just telling believers, reminding them of what was previously taught somewhere else in the Bible, or what was taught somewhere else in Scripture about Antichrist. How Antichrist manipulates people, he feeds off the wisdom of Satan, he decrees false scriptures, and he is a king over all the children of pride, is the conclusion of the chapter. Very simple for somebody that has the Holy Spirit with discernment, because you're getting spiritual things. Um, what does the Amplified Bible teach? The same Bible I just showed has a rapture explanation under 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What do they teach about Leviathan? Job 41 verse 1, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? The footnote here, or the crocodile. In recent years, archaeologists have uncovered the remains of crocodiles, much larger and far more terrifying than those known today. That's the wisdom of the world, folks. We have to worry about crocodiles. That's what God is teaching us about out of the Amplified Bible, apparently. Well, that's not what the Holy Spirit teaches out of the pure Word of God. So who are you going to believe? You're going to be raptured out of here by the Amplified Bible? Or are you going to be brought through great tribulation by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, if he speaks the word, will not allow any harm to come to your flesh, but can take you through great tribulation? You know, it depends on what you believe the word of God is, and if you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, and even at that, what are your spiritual gifts that have been given to you, or what is the spiritual gift that God has given to you? Because everyone gets a unique spiritual gift according to the gifts of the Spirit listed in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 19 verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. God is teaching the, the, the believers that it's by the righteousness of Jesus Christ that you can be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. 
It says in Titus chapter 3, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's all Jesus Christ's power that regenerates a person. It's his righteousness, nothing we can do in the flesh, since our flesh is not justified by the law. So the Amplified Bible says here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, She has been permitted to dress in fine linen, dazzling white and clean, for the fine linen signifies the righteous acts of the saints, the ethical conduct, personal integrity, moral courage, and godly character of believers. Well, as a born-again Christian, I look at that and I laugh. Is this really, you know, I probably am a really good guy compared to what I once was in terms of looking at my fleshly deeds, for example, but they still fall way short of God's standards. So I'm never going to say I've got so much integrity or moral courage or godly character that causes me to have fine linen, white and clean. There's nothing I can do to wash my own robe. Okay, it's not by my personal ethic and ethics and morality. It's by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and being born again of the Spirit and having a spiritual body that's separate from my natural body. My natural body is not justified. Um, corruption is not going to inherit incorruption, as it says in God's Word. So again, to me, the Amplified Bible kind of echoes what I was taught as a Roman Catholic that you know, somehow you can impress God by your kind deeds or, or personal integrity. And if we're all liars, if it says, if, let God be true and every man a liar, and all liars will be cast in the lake of fire, what does that say about my flesh? You know, I still will stretch the truth. Could I still tell a lie? I absolutely could. Absolutely. I can't keep the law in my flesh, because if I do one little thing wrong, I've transgressed the entire law. So that's my comment there. The rapture. So I'm going to go back and say this again. As of 1828, the definition of rapture as a Christian doctrine was not found in the Webster's Dictionary, as I mentioned earlier. Would it eventually find its way into the Webster's Dictionary? The current Webster's Dictionary, for example. How did the definition get added or changed in the current Webster's Dictionary? Does God say Lucifer is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers transformed as the ministers of righteousness? Was this seemingly innocent word a first step to a greater agenda? All questions to ponder. So here's the current Webster's Dictionary, or at least the most recent one that I found, the 2013. Uh, you can read what it says for the word rapture on the screen, but down at number three, the final assumption of Christians into heaven during the end time, according to Christian theology. Well, it never said that before, so when was that introduced? I looked at a bunch of dictionaries between 1828 and the current time, and the word rapture has subtle changes that are made to it over time that initially looked to be somewhat innocent, but then over time, like the telephone game that I talked about earlier, causes this to happen. Okay, and what's theology? To me, theology is a word that links back to Roman Catholic education. So, um, it also says in 2b, a mystical experience in which the spirit is exalted to a knowledge of divine things. I never heard of that one. How did that get there? Who says that? Doesn't match the original Webster's Dictionary. Noah Webster's dead. Who's in charge? Okay. I'm going to talk about J.D. Rockefeller. Was he as Catholic as the Pope? I don't know. Was he? Uh, Rockefeller or his family is linked to translating Catholic influence Bibles. They've got the Wycliffe Bible translators that, you know, translate on a widespread level Bibles that have a different text than the AV 1611. And those Bibles, their text line up in many cases with the Roman Catholic text of official Roman Catholic Bibles. Why was Rockefeller warmly received by Cardinal Mercier, who was warmly received by a number of universities, and why did he fund many Baptist churches? Were they Catholic-influenced? Excerpt from Rockefeller program, it says, 
On May 15, 1911, the Supreme Court of the United States declared that Standard Oil was a monopoly in restraint of trade and should be dissolved. Rockefeller heard of the decision while golf golfing with a priest from the local Catholic Church. Rockefeller got a lot richer off of this ruling that he was a monopoly. Once his businesses were broken up, he profited even more. I believe at the time he was the richest man on earth. Uh, at least that's what the common understanding is. So he had a lot of influence. Why is he hanging out with a Catholic cardinal? Was he witnessing to the cardinal? Was he telling the cardinal that, look, my Bible says that your church is Babylon and your pope is Antichrist, so let me give you uh, some wisdom from the Lord. Was he doing that or were they doing something else? Was there a different agenda going on? And I have some questions here. The Webster's New International Dictionary, it says here that it was edited by William, William Torrey Harris. Okay, at the top. Well, who's William Torrey Harris? So I wanted to find out who the, the guy in charge was. So I, I researched this and found out that uh, that uh, he was the first president of, it looks like, um, the University of Chicago. Uh, it says, John D. Rockefeller, a Baptist, endowed the University of Chicago. Its first president, William Torrey Harris, had also founded the 1879 uh, School of Languages at the university, I suppose. And so they, those two were tied together. They had to know each other. So is William Torrey Harris an associate of Rockefeller? Well, yes, he is. And if he is now the editor of a new Webster's Dictionary, is his influence being associated with Rockefeller, who's associated in some way with Catholics, is that going to cause any changes to the dictionary? Something to think about. Here is a... Uh, an article from the New York Times from 1919. Uh, you can read what it says, Cardinal at Terrytown. Terrytown is where Rockefeller's estate was at the time. Uh, he thanks Rockefeller for giving him help in Belgium. You can research that independently. But, uh, you know, I don't know if Rockefeller down at the bottom, it says, after, after this, they all knelt and the Cardinal offered a blessing. As he was leaving, the girls gave him the school cheer. I don't know if Rockefeller was with them at that time, but were they, was Rockefeller witnessing to him, or were they uh, with one accord on a different agenda? These are things that make me think and become suspicious. Can I prove anything? Probably not. But what I can show is the current Webster's Dictionary, at least the latest one that I, that I could find, as I showed earlier, introduces new definitions to the word rapture. And this is the same dictionary that a hundred years or more prior, a guy that was associated with Rock, Rockefeller was editing. And was there a planned agenda to start changing the meaning of words? God says, I am the Lord, I change not. So God's word has its own internal dictionary where you will have a static definition that will never change. Words will never change. A flagon is a container of wine in God's word. It is not a raisin cake as many of the lexicons would have you believe. Okay, that's one example. So God's word does not change and God's definitions of words do not change. However, the dictionaries made by men do change. Is that a concern to anyone? Babylonian tactic. If you've ever read God's word, you know that the prophets are killed by corrupting the pure word. It's not just literal prophets, it's the spiritual prophets found in God's word. They get slain and they can't testify anymore once the word's been corrupted. So if a Bible is tampered with, then a spirit of slumber is sent and the world becomes drunk. So called Protestant scholars and great apologists of the KJV heroes, if you will, of the KJV, they claim that we can find value in the Septuagint manuscripts. For those that don't know what the Septuagint manuscripts are, I believe God talks about this in Ezekiel chapter 8, but the most common ones that are known are the Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and Alexandrinus, Egyptian Babylonian manuscripts that God warns us, Babylon is spiritual Egypt, see Revelation chapter 11, verse 8. 
Do any trust them with commenting on and editing the KJV Bible? Have any Christians bought their merchandise of gold, silver, and precious stones? Is the body of Christ slumbering, as God says in Matthew chapter 25? And for those that don't understand spiritual things, gold, silver, and precious stones are the wisdom from the words of God spoken through the prophets. Okay? And Jesus is the chief cornerstone, precious, and elect. James Strong, Cyrus Schofield, Benjamin Blaney. Three guys that are very influential in what is called the KJV today. James Strong has a Strong's lexicon and concordance that's oft, oftentimes been a companion to the KJV to explain what the words really mean, as if you don't have an internal dictionary by the Holy Spirit to teach you, you need James Strong to apparently clarify that maybe a flagon is in fact a raisin cake not a container of wine making the earth drunk, as God says. Schofield, professing that the Pope has superior manuscripts, older and more reliable as I think what he said in his Bible, and then using the Blaney text, Blaney, who thought the Alexandrinus must have been superior because he used it in his own private translations, uh, changed pronouns and corrupted the text as we call commonly call the KJV today. So Schofield and Strong never use the authorized version of 1611. At best, they use the Blaney KJV, which was already a leaven lump. Still had oil in it, but when you have oil in a lamp, that presents a problem for Leviathan and Behemoth, who then have to come up with tactics of deception to keep people from faith. Effects. Blaney changed the scriptures. Schofield and Strong used the corrupt Blaney text and sold alternate Bibles and teachings to blind Jerusalem. See Romans chapter 11, Matthew chapter 25 for two examples. I'm just going to give my own accounts of what I've heard firsthand in dealing with pastors and other types of people. Uh, there's a local pastor here. Uh, he graduated from Bob Jones University. He, he told me, we don't need to worry about prophetic books like Daniel or Revelations is exactly how he said. He mispronounced Revelation. He made it plural, not singular. He says, we're not going to be here. We're going to be raptured. Top Baptist scholar, guy that I know pretty well. He and I got into a disagreement. He said, And he wrote me, although Dr. Blaney changed the text, I just don't see how it affects core doctrine like the virgin birth or deity of Christ. So my comment is, well, who cares about that? Uh, Blaney was not a doctor, first of all. Why are you calling him Dr. Blaney? He didn't become a doctor until significantly later after he worked on the translation. Uh, you know, So don't call him a doctor. And, um, and who are you to say a little leaven doesn't leaven the whole lump? You know, the scripture cannot be broken. So was Blaney's change to the text, were, were they correct or not? That's all that matters. Did he break the scripture or did he purify it? Because if Blaney purified it, then the people in 1611 didn't have quite the truth back then. We only got it through Blaney, a guy that thought the Egyptian Septuagint was superior to the received text. So why are we letting a Babylonian leaning uh, guy with maybe a master's degree uh, be working on a Christian Bible. Things that I think about based on my secular background and quality assurance. So what he came back and said to me is, John, what you're doing is casting doubt on the very KJ King James Bible, which is being used today by those who stand for it. Okay, so yeah, that's what I'm doing. Because the KJV Bible today is not the one that King James authorized. So how would you like it if you wrote a will to your children and somebody came by and changed a few words here and there. Is it still your will? Well, if you think it is, then send the will to me and I'll make a couple changes. I'll, I'll cross out your beneficiary and put my name in and you can see how, what impact, if any, that'll have. That's kind of like how you tamper with scripture. God warns, don't add to or diminish from his word. Uh, you cannot because the scripture cannot be broken. Another local pastor that I know says, we use Strong's lexicon to understand the scriptures. 
Jesus Christ will come again for his church in what is known as the rapture. This will occur before the period of time the Bible refers to as the tribulation. Okay, well, where are you getting that from? I mean, I come from a highly Jesuit, huge highly Jesuit-influenced family. I was raised Catholic. I think I know where you're getting it from. Have you ever heard the Church of Babylon uh, in the Bible? So why are you using Strong's lexicon? All that does is line up with the Roman Catholic teachings. So all this seems to me, John Doerr, to fit together perfectly. But every one of us will be held accountable for our beliefs and our words, according to Jesus Christ. Another local pastor um, that I know who lived at the time, maybe about 25 miles from me, so, uh, I wrote him and he said, you know, I wrote him about the change in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, somewhere around verse 7, I believe. And he wrote back and said, well, John, the change from she to he does not seem to be necessary, but I don't see that it matters either. So if he's a, a pastor of a church and he's okay with changing pronouns, uh, he says, I believe in plenary verbal, not conceptual inspiration and preservation. So I have no doubts as to whether or not the Hebrew text from which the AV was translated is perfect. Well, what good does that do if you're not fluent in Hebrew? I speak English. I understand English. So uh, his church happened to say, at least they said at the time, we teach and preach exclusively from the authorized King James Version, believing it to be the word of God without proven error in the English language. But they were using the Blaney Bible. And so you can decide for yourself whether a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, but he's okay with making pronoun changes. It doesn't bother him because someone like me might say, okay, well, well, Antichrist is holding a drunk woman in his arms, but if you change the pronoun, now Antichrist is holding a man in his arms. Uh, a lot of Christians would believe that man to be Jesus Christ because they call him the lily of the valley in this silly song that they're singing. So what's going on here? So it doesn't matter? I guess, you know, wisdom is, is based upon whatever you believe in, but a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And uh, it, this, this is yet another example of pastors that I've dealt with. We have another guy that I dealt with directly. I went down to his church and confronted him on the issue of the Bible directly. Uh, shortly before he was convicted as a sex criminal, I will add. But I heard him say, the Pope is a godly man and a man of God. Now, this is a guy that's the head pastor of a large, highly influential, independent Baptist church. He taught that we will be raptured before tribulation. And I asked a bunch of people at this church, the church board, to describe to me, you know, Leviathan, behemoth, and they gave the same answers I talked about earlier. Hippopotamuses, crocodiles. So if you want to believe a pre-trib rapture, that's the camp that you're in, guys. Most missionaries that I've met, we could be raptured at any time, they tell me. Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. And then they start explaining the Roman Catholic Church to me. Like, we're not like the Roman Catholics, you know, but we're going to be raptured. You know, that... And none of them, 0% of them, could tell me any meaningful things about the Catholic Church other than they've just heard that the Catholic Church has problems in them. But they're, unless you're raised Catholic, you're probably very uninformed about what the Catholic Church really stands for. Popular pre-tribulation passages, as I previously mentioned, I'm listing a few there. Remember that we cannot privately interpret Scripture. Precept must be upon precept, per Isaiah 28. So we as saints must hear the spiritual testimony of God. The unsaved person cannot receive a spiritual testimony. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. 
yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, for born-again believers who receive spiritual things, would be my comment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others. Remember what sleep means spiritually, lacking discernment. But let us watch and be sober, so that we're not drunk on flagons of wine like the woman in Solomon's arms in chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So I list below Ephesians chapter 5, Psalm 78, Romans 1, Ezekiel 22 are all examples of God telling us that his wrath is upon all those who have not received the Holy Ghost through faith in his word and repentance of their unrighteousness, which is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. If you haven't been born again, your flesh is creating a sin problem for you because it's not justified. No matter how good you think you are in your flesh, you're not justified. You've already been judged and condemned already. You'll burn in the lake of fire for eternity, even if you're the best person in the flesh on earth, if you haven't been born again of God's Spirit by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. See Matthew chapter 25, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. It says in Romans chapter 11, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. If you're sleeping, you're lacking discernment. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that follows along with what is written in Matthew chapter 25. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Matthew chapter 25, verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. So precept is upon precept here. Uh, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, just like the wise virgin, virgins in Matthew chapter 25. In Romans chapter 6 it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's a nice explanation of death and life, so that you can understand what God is teaching the saints. Continuing on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Which is following along with Matthew chapter 25 on a spiritual level where the foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. See Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went into him to the marriage, with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So it's important to understand spiritual things. I mentioned that clouds are symbolic of prophets, and um, lamps would also be symbolic of prophets. The lamps with oil have God's prophets. The lamps without oil have false prophets. So... Lamps and clouds being synonyms, you can use your discernment and the Holy Spirit can put these two teachings together and let you know what's going to happen. In Mark chapter 13, it says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. 
and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Remember, the earth has four corners, which four angels will stand on, and be in control of the winds, the four winds. And this is a different lesson. I don't want to get sidetracked. But if you read the entire canon of Scripture and you have the Holy Spirit putting together all of these parables into spiritual teachings, you'll understand what's going to happen. It says in John chapter 9, as Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. In other words, Jesus gives us his Holy Spirit so we can see spiritual things while the natural person thinks they understand, but they can't see spiritual things. They're blinded until they become born again. And even at that, there's a diversity of gifts of the Spirit. So not everybody's on the same playing field, even in the body of believers in terms of what they can discern. In Romans chapter 11, it says, What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded, according as it is written. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. As David saith, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back all we. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more is their fullness? See Psalm 69. God is very merciful. He'll allow his people to be taken into a snare. Biblical corruption is so deceptive, if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived, but God will put a shout out and let his people rise with oil in their lamps if they ultimately believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. Is God telling us spiritually that he will lift the slumber from the eyes of his church and restore them to understanding of his pure word? Jesus says you must be able to hear what the spirit says. He counsels that to every church in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Remember, the church would be the bride of Christ, a woman. Clouds and lamps are symbolic of the scriptures. And air and oil have power, spiritual power. So we need to know these spiritual terms to understand spiritual testimonies and teachings from Jesus Christ. This one in Matthew chapter 24, it says, Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. And I put a bunch of verses there to cross-reference, and I'm going to go through a few of them. If you have an ear, the Spirit says that a woman is synonymous with a church. In Ezekiel chapter 23, it says, There were two women, the daughters of one mother. Are those two women the same two women that are referenced in Matthew chapter 24? In Zechariah chapter 5, it says, Behold, there came out two women. In Proverbs chapter 30, it says, The horse leech hath two daughters. In Matthew chapter 25, there's two types of virgins, wise and foolish. The one that's taken is the wise one. The one that's left is the foolish. There's two trees in Matthew chapter 7, corrupt and good. A tree can be symbolic of a person and is symbolic of a person who is part of either the true church or the false Babylonian church. In Romans chapter 11, God saves his bride, not the harlot. See Revelation chapter 18 verse 2. In Job chapter 31, the women are grinding, or a woman is grinding. And in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus will grind those rebelling against him. And in Job chapter 39, two women are depicted, see Ezekiel chapter 23, the scriptures return to each other precept upon precept, because in a multitude of counselors there is safety, 
And Jesus says, thy testimonies are my delights and my counselors. He tells us that we say this back to him, that God's testimonies are our delights and our counselors. We don't believe in the precepts of men. Because in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. That's not referencing men as counselors. Those are the counsels that we get from the prophets of the Most High, ultimately coming from the Holy Spirit, from our Lord Jesus Christ. In Numbers chapter 11, it's revealed that grinding is related to the consumption of doctrine through either the Babylonian uh, Christ or the, the true Jesus Christ, the Lord. Would professing Baptists such as J.D. Rockefeller, Bob Jones Sr., John Rice, Jack Scapp, Jack Hiles, and countless others promote the Pope's manuscripts and or apologetics or word choices? Would they, when any of these men have the testimony translated in 1611, written on the table of their hearts? Is there a connection between Rome and the pre-tribulation rapture? I'm asking that question again. Let's examine the teachers. Jack Hiles, who's dead now, but you can read about Linda Murphy, is the daughter of the late Jack Hiles. And this is what she wrote about her own dad. And that's my source. And, you know, even she said her dad had a, an agenda where he would tr twist the scriptures and try to control people. And she described uh, a definition of a cult. And you can read what it says there. Um, Jack Hiles was quoted as saying the word rapture ought to be a household word. Okay, and I give my source there. He also loved his Schofield Bible. So where are these guys getting all of this stuff? Is it from the Word of God? Because I've read the Word of God, and I haven't uh, ever believed in a word called rapture relating to any type of Christian doctrine. So his daughter goes on to, to I'm not going to read every word here, but you can see the testimony that she gives it's quite disturbing about what he would do in his private life and how he used people and used their money what did god say was the root of all evil the love of money is the root of all evil so if you're collecting money from thousands of people and you're using it for your own selfish lust or needs are you serving god there's my source and again this is someone that is in a prominent church that's teaching a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine that many are believing because they put their trust in men. They don't put trust in the Lord. What does God say? It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men. Let God be true in every man a liar. Pre-trib rapture, Hiles Anderson College. The college's first president was Robert Billings, who later served as Ronald Reagan's liaison to the fundamentalist Christian movement in the 1980 presidential campaign. And you can read what else it says. Um, you know, I, I don't personally believe Ronald Reagan was even close to being a, He wasn't a Christian, in my opinion, and I believe the Reagans had some type of association with astrology and other things forbidden by Scripture. Reagan was also accused by at least one former MK Ultra Vatican slave of being a slave abuser, a sexual abuser of women. Um, so that being said, uh, there is a book called The Faith of Ronald Reagan, and in this book it says, in this excerpt here, American conservative movement during the late 70s and into the 80s, the Christian conservative movement began to grow under the leadership of men such as Reverend Jerry Falwell Dr. Tim LaHaye, Dr. Bill Bright, Ed McTeer, and Robert Billings. The Christian conservative movement, also known as the New Right, flourished. And between 1977 and 1980, Reagan crisscrossed the nation speaking to Christian and conservative organizations, which at the surface sounds great. You know, there's nothing wrong with standing up for Christianity. But if you're going to do it, you got to do it in spirit and in truth the right way. And it's very easy to be taken in a snare here. And one of the snares is becoming involved with Vatican doctrine or Vatican uh, 
textual changes to the Word of God, which examining most or all of these individuals, at least most of them, I believe they they commonly identified with critical text Bibles that have been changed to align to some extent with the text of the Roman Catholic Church. Timothy LaHaye from the Left Behind series used critical text Bibles, and I've got other information on here. Um, Billings was a Bob Jones University graduate. I'll be talking more about that shortly. Bob Jones University to this day sells the New American Standard Bible, as well as they profess a belief in the Blaney KJV as a great translation, probably they're still their primary translation. But as I mentioned earlier, the New American Standard Bible, along with the Amplified Bible, both made possible by the Lachman Foundation, uh, follow the Vatican text in many cases. And also, as I mentioned, the Amplified Bible uses the word rapture in parentheses to explain what happens in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The Christian Coalition was launched in part by a guy named Paul Weyrich, who helped Robert Billings, who bought pre-trib rapture believer and Vatican synatic manuscript or Catholic influence Bible subscriber Falwell and Weyrich together. Now Falwell endorsed the New King James Bible, which in many, many, many cases has been changed from the authorized version to align with the Catholic text. I can say that, and I've got a number of sources here that give additional information. But if you read this expert excerpt down here, you got this guy Billings and Weyrich. Now, Weyrich professed to believe, I believe, some type of orthodox religion, but he was also heavily associated with a Roman Catholic college out in California. Uh, and Shafley, I believe that's a reference to Phyllis Shafley, is a prominent Catholic from St. Louis. So we've got a mingling here of Catholics and professing Christians that are all involved in a biblical text that's not lining up exactly with the authorized version of 1611. That doesn't make for a good outcome. It's a deadly formula, and if they influence the masses under the guise of a conservative movement, will they be teaching people about a pre-trib rapture to put them at ease? Will they be teaching other doctrines that are not part of God's word? Something that everyone should consider. Questions that should be asked. Let's take a look at a guy named... John Rice, and a lot of these guys really like to call themselves doctors. To, I don't know why they make themselves feel better. Maybe they're given a they, the doctor of theology, doctor of divinity. What good does that do? Does God ever talk about giving flattering titles to yourself? Uh, the Holy Ghost is sufficient, so you don't need a man to teach you. The Holy Ghost will lead you to all truth according to Jesus Christ. But uh, anyway, that being said, Rice, who is associated with Sword of the Lord and maybe founded the Sword of the Lord or was one of the early founders or members, uh, is quoted here commenting on the American Standard Version, which was a, uh, you know, very similar to the revised version of Westcott and Hort. And the American Standard Version was adopted also by James Strong, and it's uh, heavily influenced from the critical text, the Vatican and Synatic Manuscripts, the Septuagint. And he says the translators of the American Standard Version had the advantage of having access to the three oldest manuscripts with which we are familiar. The Vatican, the Alexandrian, the, the Alexandrian and the Synatic Manuscripts. It corrects some mistakes in the KJV. Oh, really, John? Because God says that Babylon, the church of Satan, is spiritually Sodom in Egypt. So if you're taking Egyptian manuscripts and making a statement that they correct some mistakes into what Christians understand and believe the word of God is, this may be a big problem. Okay, so he goes on to give some examples here, but he's also a very prominent person in the so-called KJV community. So what's he doing telling everyone that he thinks maybe the, the Pope's manuscripts or the Septuagint are superior in some cases. 
something that I don't really understand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it says, Therefore, let no man glory in men. Remember, God says, Let God be true and every man a liar. In Jeremiah 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. It says in Psalm 118, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In Romans chapter 3, it says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. See 1 John chapter 5 for the only witnesses in earth. God tells you what the witnesses are, and men are not part of that. You know, you're, you're going to have the word of God and the Holy Spirit as your witnesses here in earth. That's who you believe, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God is not a respecter of persons, and he puts no confidence in men. We have to be born out of this world. So here's my left behind Rise of the Antichrist notes. I saw this film, oh, maybe a couple weeks ago. And I made notes as I watched the film. And overall, I thought the film was rather boring, unimpressive. I didn't go in with any expectations. I really don't like watching uh, Christian entertainment but nevertheless, in order to complete this sermon lesson, I wanted to actually go in and firsthand experience this. I had seen other Left Behind movies years ago and thought that they were just completely unscriptural and just made a mockery out of God's word. So my notes are, I wasn't sure which Bible was being quoted. During the sparse use of scripture, they seemed to be putting a hybrid version of their own together I, until that film comes out and I'm able to pause the video and and see exactly what they're quoting I can't say for sure but it certainly wasn't the Word of God that I heard when they tried to quote scripture uh, rapture as a word was used many times in this film and I've spent the last you know quite a bit of time explaining where that word came from I didn't feel there was any biblical truth in the film about how Antichrist deceived people uh, the only focus was on a final Antichrist, so you don't have to worry about the existing Babylonian world religion deceiving the world and reigning over the kings of the earth. It's just one final bad guy, according to the film, that we have to worry about. There was no reference to any final prayer book or world Bible that Antichrist uses to unite the world in the name of peace. No reference there. How would there be? They're not using the word of God. They have no discernment, in my opinion. There's no understanding of the mark of the beast. Uh, and there was some comment made in the film that led me to believe that they were thinking something about on the mark. Uh, the word on was used, but I, I don't want to quote it out of context there. But Christians understand that the mark will be in the forehead or in the right hand. And I've already commented on what the mark is, so I won't get sidetracked. There was no understanding of biblical salvation in that believing the pure, incorruptible word of God, getting chastened, scourged, receiving the Holy Spirit, crying, uh, you know, enduring chastening. None of that. It's just, you know, dear Jesus, I love you after hearing the NIV or whatever they're, they're trying to quote. And uh, so there wasn't any actual salvation depicted properly. And the final Antichrist winds up in the film getting outed by an apparent new believer who never heard any pure scripture that was depicted in the film. Uh, you know, the final Antichrist seemed to be outsmarted by a guy that knew Jesus Christ less than a day, for example, according to the film. And Babylon was not a focus, as I recall. I don't recall them using the word Babylon in the film. I could be wrong. Again, I just made notes as I watched this, uh, this movie. And the teachings focused on natural interpretations, as, they, as I would expect that they do. Everything's a natural understanding. There's no spiritual discernment because I didn't hear any word of God in the film. When they tried to quote scripture, it wasn't anything that I recognized as a pure, unbroken testimony. They could be piecing together different versions of the Bible. It was really hard for me to have discernment there. So those are my notes. These are um, uh, my recollections having watched the film. 
So, witnessing to others, things Christians should know. Pre-tribulation rapture is a fairly new doctrine and became more known starting around 1830, sometime around the Oxford movement is when it ramped up. But I believe, as I've said, that Rome was working on this for you know, centuries before they started publicly introducing this and infiltrating every place of learning uh, and every type of learning, books, churches, etc., the word rapture as it relates to biblical doctrine comes from the Roman Bible of 1610. That's the earliest reference that I could find as it relates to some type of Bible doctrine. Many prominent pre-tribulation rapture teachers think the Pope has superior manuscripts or they use Bibles that were influenced by the Pope uh, or line up with the Roman text. Jesus always says we will have tribulation. Jesus prays to keep us in the world, not to take us out. Clouds, lamps, air, oil, all have spiritual meanings that natural people will not discern. Christians see a spiritual testimony that unsaved people cannot. And a final Bible will be used to separate believers from heathens. Uh, that will be the ultimate test. And if you're not sealed with the Holy Spirit, you will be caused to receive the mark of the beast. And if you're not sealed with the Holy Spirit, doesn't matter what time in history you live, you're not going into the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again of the Spirit. The world is drunk on the wine of Babylon, which is spiritually false doctrine, and if possible, the very elect would be deceived. So all these are teachings out of the word of God, and they don't seem to fit very well with the idea that we're going to be zapped out of here before bad things happen, a pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, if you read the Word of God in its pure, unbroken state, uh, Jesus Christ will teach you what He wants you to know, and you don't have to cleave to the precepts of men. So in conclusion, the word rapture is found in the Catholic Jesuit Reims 1610 Bible with a suggestion of a transport to heaven. Blaney broke the scripture, which seems to have influenced the idea that a physical removal will happen to the saints prior to Great Tribulation. Jesus Christ does not teach this in the A.V. 1611, which is absolutely not the KJV commonly published today. Have all places of learning been infiltrated by Babylon? Are they responsible to keep believers in a state of ease before the placement of the abomination of desolation? Can any person refuse to be caused to receive the mark of the beast? Will many lose faith because of no rapture? Thank you guys for watching and listening to this rather lengthy sermon lesson. I do appreciate it. And again, I'll close by saying I don't expect people to believe with everything I say. Take it back to Scripture. Pray. Trust the Lord. He will lead you to all truth. But remember what God says about precept must be upon precept, and in a multitude of counselors there is safety, and God's testimonies are our delights and our counselors, so nothing will be privately interpreted. And if you have the spiritual vocabulary, you will see that the parables line up exactly to tell us what will exactly happen based on the time that we live here on earth and what God wants us to know. Will the elect be gathered after the tribulation, as it says in Matthew chapter 24 and other places as well? I think it's important that everybody who believes they're a Christian ponders these questions and backs them up with a multitude of scriptures so that they have a great understanding so that we who are Christians can be effective in our witnessing to others, especially those that are lost that need to come to faith. Thanks again, and I'll look forward to giving another lesson sometime in the near future.